Okay, the rate of people entering has slowed right down, so I think it's probably time to start this webinar um, that has been set up by Policy Press, part of Bristol University Press. And we're focusing on support for students who are taking on research projects. I'm Helen Cara. I'm an independent researcher and a writer of books for Policy Press and <clears throat> other publishers sometimes too. Um, probably won't talk about those. Uh, it's lovely to be here for this webinar and I'm delighted because we have a terrific lineup of speakers. We have Amy Grant, who is a qualitative researcher with a long-standing interest in documentary analysis and is based at Swansea University Centre for Lactation, Infant Feeding and Translational Research. We have Richard Phillips, who is Professor of Human Geography at the University of Sheffield, who's a specialist in creative and arts-led research methodologies, which he practices in his own work. Richard's having some internet problems, so he's recorded his talk, and he is intending to be with us for the Q&A later on if his internet behaves well enough, which we have very much hope it will. Then Barbara Basso is an Associate of Canterbury Christchurch University, where she worked as Senior Lecturer in the Centre for Career and Personal Development for a number of years. Nicole Brown is Associate Professor at University College London, Institute of Education and Director of Social Research and Practice and Education Limited. And Narelle Lemon um, from Australia is an educator, researcher, writer and creative, having studied classical music and visual arts. She currently works as an Associate Professor in Education at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia. So her, her contribution will also be videoed because it's like three o'clock in the morning there. And it's a bit too unreasonable to expect people to get up and join in with webinars when it's the middle of the night uh, where they are. So that's a very quick introduction to our panelists and to myself. So we're going to hear from each panelist in turn, and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, we're intending to finish at 5 p.m. So I won't mess about. I will introduce you straight away to Amy Grant, who will speak to us first. Amy, go ahead. Hi there, let me just get my slides up. Okay, so um, today I'm going to be talking to you about how to do your research project. Um, and although my book is about using documents, I've kept this pretty broad. Um, so I'm going to give you four top tips today because I only have a few minutes. Sorry, my slide didn't want to move then. There we are. Okay, so tip number one is to be methodical and organized. So I think this is generally good advice for researchers. Um, and so what I would say is to read widely, don't focus all of your energies into one area. So really think about the methods that are best suited for your research. Um, and to be really organised with your decisions. Um, so on the slide, you'll see the little dog that you see throughout my book. So I have notes like this at key points, who has all of the papers and can't find the one which is buried right at the very bottom, um, which I think can very easily happen when you're doing research. But two, is to write everything down. So from the beginning parts of your literature review, those little ideas that you're having, make notes in the margins of your paper, get a research diary, uh, which Nicole will be talking to you about later, um, make notes in a Word document. It doesn't matter where they go. You don't need to write a lot, but just do it regularly. This really makes it easier when you're coming to the point of writing up your dissertation because you've got lots of little nuggets of gold that you can then weave through into a narrative. Tip number three is to get writing, um, which I um, always recommend that students start by drafting a structure for their whole dissertation. And this also applies if you're writing a report for a funder or a journal article. If you have a blank page, it can be really intimidating. You don't necessarily know what you need to write and how much. So starting off, 
getting all of the names of the chapter titles and then the subsections within chapters, knowing what needs to go in each, you can work out that perhaps you only need to write 200 words about your sample and that then doesn't feel so scary. By having this kind of structure as well, it means that sections that you've written can be moved about later if there's a, a change to the order needed. Um, or perhaps if some bits need to be squished in together so you reduce your word count, this will make it much easier and, and get you to the point of finishing your dissertation on time. Tip number four is to think like an examiner. And if you're writing for publication, think like your reviewers. So have a look at the guidance that's available to you. Your university will have a dissertation handbook um, that you can go through, you can see what's expected. Sometimes there'll be three or four, maybe even up to 10 criteria that are used to assess your work. If you're really good at some of them and completely ignore all of them, you won't be able to get a good grade. So you can see on the side of the image, there's a scrappy pile of papers with a, a post-it note saying, mark these by Tuesday. And that really reflects the reality of your examiner's lives. Your dissertation is likely to be one of many that they have to mark. So make it easy for them to give you a good grade pull through those key points from your marking scheme into your dissertation so it's really easy to pick out your good practice. There are another 20 tips within my book, but I don't have time to take you through all of them today. Um, but if you would like to know more, my book will be available from March. Um, and I'm also available on Twitter and talk about research with documents there quite a lot. Thank you very much. And I'll hand back to Helen. Thanks, Amy. That was lovely, clear and succinct and generally brilliant. And I will now ask um, for Richard's video to be played so that we can all watch that. May I just say hello to everyone? Oh, uh, sorry, yes, do. Before it starts, it's lovely to see you all here. And uh, and I won't talk for longer because my video goes on for a little while, but I will be around later for, for chatting questions. Thank you. Video, please. Thank you to Policy Press for inviting me to come along and say a little bit about using creative writing as a means of doing social research. I want to, uh, to do that, drawing upon uh, the book that I published with Helen Cara, who's also here today. And I want to, uh, to focus my comments um, on using creative writing as a means of doing participatory research, research involving participants. And I'm specifically thinking of what students can do. So you've asked me to, to give advice to students. I'm thinking of undergraduates and postgraduates. And I'm thinking about people who support those students doing research. So a number of, uh, of things I'd like to say. Um, why one might use creative writing as a means of doing any kind of a social research is, um, is a question which is a little bit too broad for me to go into, but just to make a couple of points, um, because I, I really want to encourage you to do it. Um, and those, those points are really that creative writing can open doors that other methods uh, can leave closed. And here's an example of some, some, some ways in which it, that, that happened. And this is a, a workshop that took place at the Glasgow Women's Library. My co-researcher, co-investigator Nafisa Ali um, was running a workshop and she's working with a facilitator, a creative writing facilitator. And the workshop was all about exploring sex, desire and relationships um, among young um, Muslim women in, in Glasgow. And um, Creative writing opened doors to explore those questions that would have been really hard to explore in other ways. Um, ask direct questions, interview questions, ask people to account for themselves. And a lot of times people will close down, invite people to participate in a storytelling workshop and a writing workshop in which they feel comfortable and safe and, and often open up. And this workshop was a, was a really um, open space often a fun space and Nafisa talks about how much laughter there was at the workshop. But it was also a workshop which was very productive 
in the sense that some brilliant stories were told. So creative writing involving participants opened up stories, some of which were productive simply in terms of revealing and, and, and telling, telling of, of experiences that are quite hard, as I've already said, to reach in other ways. So as, as social research data, but some of the um, stories that were told are also just excellent stories from, from in terms of pieces of writing. And accordingly, we published some of them in this anthology, A Match Made in Heaven, where participants at the workshop published their stories alongside some more established um, young British Muslim writers. So <clears throat> my first advice to you really, if you're a student thinking of, of using creative writing in this way, is do it, have a go. Just have a go. It is open to you. It's possible to you. Um, and doing it can be insightful and it can also be fun for you and the other participants. So firstly, just really encourage you. That's the most important thing I want to say. <clears throat> but I also, and going back to that image of a workshop in Glasgow, you can, you can guess from looking at that quite how much organisation was involved. There's a lot of people, there's a facilitator, there's a space there's some catering, it, it took some doing to get there. And as a student, you might wonder if that's possible for you. So the next piece of advice that I'd give you is yes, it is possible, but it's more possible if you work with energy and people who are all already there. So this is a space for the women's library that's already there. And this is a group of people, some of whom already knew each other through a reading group and they'd expressed interests in writing and reading together through that group. If you work with um, work with what's already there, then you'll be pushing at an open door if you offer that group of people more of what they're already interested in. So that's the second point, really. If you tried recruiting, if you tried to make people do this and they didn't want to, you'd have a hard time. Work with what's already there, my second point. My third point is to be open to participants' ideas. What do they want to do? One of these workshops didn't want to do short stories at all. They wanted to write a play together rather than separately. Another one wanted to work with blogging. So different, um, different ideas came from the workshops. But another example of why it's often good to be open to participants' ideas and to see where they take you and often in quite unexpected directions comes from a project that I was running this summer with a group of 11 students in Sheffield, undergraduates and postgraduates some of whom <clears throat> I hope are here today at this webinar. And my idea for the, uh, for the project was that the students would interview e each other about experiences of lockdown, experiences uh, sometimes of loneliness during lockdown. So it was going to be an interview project. But then one of the students, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the students made a suggestion I hadn't expected which was that she told me about a project run by the Science Museum and a curator she knew called Collecting COVID. And what they wanted to do was to collect objects of all different kinds that might contribute to a national collection on experiences of COVID. So um, I um, was introduced by a curator to a curator by the student. We had some conversations which widened out and the curator suggested that rather than um, simply using the interviews in the way that I'd expected, which would be to type in the, um, the, the responses and, and uh, to, to do this on a purely digital level, that we use notebooks and write in the notebooks um, what uh, the interviews uh, revealed, what the respondents said, maybe put some quotations in. So it was always going to be an element of writing in this project, but the writing assumed a much more tangible form than I'd expected. And then the curator made another suggestion, which was that in addition to working with these notebooks, we also invite people in interviews to bring along an object which spoke about their experiences of lockdown and to talk about the object and perhaps to write about the object. So a project which had been a more conventional interview project became a project um, which was much more interested in the materiality of the interviews, the writing of interview notes, the collecting of objects. What did this reveal? Um, so uh, my second point, just to summarize that, is to be open to participants' ideas when conducting work like this. But my third point is to pay attention to the writing and see where the writing takes you. Let me show you some of the writing that came out of this. So in addition to writing up uh, the interview notes, we also um, 
find some notes about the objects, people writing about the objects they brought along. Here's a first year student, my lockdown item, snowman, 2020, and she's done a little doodle of the snowman. Reminds me of missed holidays and holidays of Christmas past. And the snowman, by the way, is a toy. She's drawn a picture of it and she's provided it too. Instead of spending Christmas with my family, I was visiting their graves. Christmas this year did not feel like Christmas should. Pay attention to the writing on the page, but also to the writing on the page of this other student, a student in, in their fourth year. And here, are, here is the object which the student is writing about, which is a tin of yeast. I'll let you read their exact words and we'll take a slightly closer look at them in a moment. But what this student is telling us is about how for him, yeast uh, symbolized the lockdown for two reasons. One is that with all the time he had on his hands, in a metaphorical and literal sense, and all the time he had on his hands, making bread um, was something he did, but that was also something he did to connect with his roommates. The smell of bread, the eating of bread in the student house was a way of connecting, but it was also a way of remembering a mother, his mother, who'd once enrolled him on a bread making course and who wasn't there with him anymore. And so this object was, it was a reminder of, um, of her and a connection with the people who were with him. And so my next point really is let the, light, let the writing lead and pay attention to the writing and read, um, read the writing, its words, um, but also between the lines of the writing. So we see, and we zoom in here, but we see a different kind of personality between these two students. We see doodles in one, we see crossings out, we see um, pressure on the page and thoughtfulness and slowness. And there's an awful lot that comes through in the writing. So my, that's my, my next point there is really about once we've ceded some control, let other people bring ideas in, we then let the writing lead a little bit as well, see where that will take us. And as is often the case with this particular kind of writing, um, it's a form of free writing in the sense that people were asked to write without having much time to think about what they were going to say. So as free writing, things come out that even they hadn't expected. My final point, my final piece of advice is that if we are going to do creative writing and to do it collaboratively with participants, we need to give them some of the credit for what comes out of this. So one of the things that I ensured that I did is out of this project on uh, student loneliness is that the paper that's come out of it has been submitted to and accepted by a journal is that it's owned by all of us, all 11 students and me. So we're all co-authors in the paper together. Um, if we're really going to do work involving participants on, on any kind of um, even uh, field, we need to, we need to share that um, ownership of what comes out of this. So um, there we go. Those are my um, tips and thank you very much. Thank lovely. you. Thank you, Richard. That's lovely. And I'm going to move on um, straight away, please, to Barbara. Hello, thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I'm afraid I've had one or two internet problems since the webinar has started, so I'm not sure that I'm, uh, I'm hoping that it's all going to be fine now, um, but I'm not sure whether my screen is going to be as I would ideally like it to be. I can see it's not quite, um, but I'm going to try and yes, that's better. Lovely. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this webinar. It's great to see so many people here. Um, my name is Dr. Barbara Bassett. Um, I'm an associate of Canterbury Christchurch University. I worked for Christchurch for many years within the field of counselling, coaching, mentoring and career development. And I've helped and supported lots of students undertake their research studies, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Um, counselling, coaching, mentoring, in particular counselling, is one of those fields where you may feel that um, there, there are perhaps different ways needed in order to undertake qualitative research. 
in that when we think of qualitative research, I think the things that automatically come to our minds are things like interviews and focus groups. And when it comes to a programs like counselling, coaching and mentoring, especially counselling, it's not always desirable, um, uh, appropriate even to interview people um, directly or to talk with them in focus groups. And so this particular um, webinar is, and this the book that I've written, which is about to be published, is all about doing qualitative desk-based research. And this is what I'm going to focus on this afternoon. Um, so what then is desk-based research and what do I mean by it? Um, this, the, the book focuses on desk-based research where you gather your own data. I think often we can get a little bit confused in relation to what desk-based research is, and we think of it as some kind of secondary research. This is research where we gather our own data from sources that are readily available and very easily accessible over the internet. So it's a form of primary research. Now, when we think about the wide variety of resources that are available to us as researchers and as students, um, there really are lots of different things that we can delve into in order to find the data and to source the data that we need. And as I've said already, all readily available and easily accessible via the internet. So I'm going to start with written sources, um, which we can see mostly on the left of the screen here. And perhaps the one that stands out is all those newspapers, um, all those different newspapers that are there. Again, all available online, of course, and available through university libraries. Um, but Studies could be, uh, these resources could be used in order to research a wide variety of different topics and different subjects. But then we get to perhaps more personal data. On the left, we can see a pen and it's someone's written in a book and it reminds us of a personal journal. Lots of people nowadays do keep personal journals for a whole variety of reasons. And they like to post them online on various websites, sharing all sorts of experiences that they've had, maybe issues and difficulties and challenges that they've faced in their lives. Bottom left, there's a letter which actually starts with Dear Me, uh, Letters to Self. There are websites that have letters that people have posted, letters to my mental illness and so on. And then in the middle, um, we have blogs. Um, blogs are recordings of things that people have experienced again, where they want to keep a record of that online. So they are a number of written resources that are readily available. Then, of course, we have um, video resources as well. Um, we have um, clips on YouTube's video logs, for instance, um, and also top right TV documentaries, numbers of really high quality TV documentaries that we can watch in order to have as data to, for our qualitative research studies. Bottom right, then, we have a number of audio resources whether that's radio programmes that have been broadcast and have been recorded, um, or podcasts, which again are very, very popular at the moment. Different ways that people have of recording their lives. Now, top right, you can probably see something that I've given two asterisks, and that's to always make sure that the data resources that we are accessing and using are of high quality. And um, there's nothing worse than trying to listen to a recording that's not very clear or a video that's not, not and also not very clear. So we have all of these resources that could be used as data 
data that is already there for us. So are the advantages of doing a desk-based study like this? I think there are many, and I've just highlighted a few here to finish. Um, I think the, the key one for me is the one that says it opens up areas that are potentially sensitive. In my years of teaching and helping and supporting students on their counselling, coaching and mentoring and career development courses, many of my own students were interested in finding out more about sense, what I would call sensitive areas whether it's issues of mental health or um, issues of offending, reoffending, suicide even, and so on. Um, and this, these are not areas that we can easily talk to people about or ethically talk to people about directly. These online resources give us those opportunities. I do, on the whole, think that a desk-based project is easier to manage. Um, we've, we can all hear stories of res, um, research participants who have agreed to take part, but then for a whole range of good reasons can no longer be interviewed or be part of that focus group. These are resources that are there for us already. So in general, our studies can be more predictable and easier to manage. Um, there's lower risk of harm to participants, but also to researchers themselves. So this is something that, again, I really encourage you to have a go with. If you're thinking about your topic or you're thinking about your own research project, um, this is, these are good areas to investigate. Thank you very much. Thanks, Barbara. That's great. Um, although I have to say all our panelists are running over time a little. So let me go straight on with no further ado to Nicole. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, can I just um, kind of highlight that I have been invited to talk uh, specifically um, about this book, um, Making the Most of Your Research Journal. Um, and I think all of us have been invited to speak about a um, particular kind of our work. And um, the questions that are coming in don't perhaps necessarily um, respond to that or, 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 or our talks don't respond to those questions quite as well, perhaps, um, because the interests may be slightly different. So I just want to point out that some of the questions that um, have been raised um, around research methods and approaches of data collection or data analyses, some of us um, panelists are actually delivering workshops on those topics. Um, so do check us out, do check out our social media um, and, and, and you know basically join us for, for one of those workshops if you would like to. So I'm going to be talking very quickly about making the most of your research journal. Um, this book was something that has come out of my own doctoral research. Um, as everybody who starts a research project, I was recommended to have a research journal. And the funny thing was that at the time I was already a lecturer and I was already supervising um, master's level students in their research work. And I also recommended to keep a research journal. But once I started kind of trying to explain, you know, look for myself as to what I need to um, to do to get the per the best research journal and to get the most out of it, I didn't find the book that I wanted. So in the end, um, about two months into my PhD, I said to my supervisors, it looks like I'm going to have to write that book myself because it's not actually there. And this was then after I'd finished my, my PhD. I did actually sit down and write this book. So what I'm doing in with this book in specific is trying to kind of um, give some guidance on how to literally make the most of your research journal and um, what to record and how to record. But really it's all about myth busting. 
So the first thing that I would like to say is that, you know, a lot of the time people are talking about the research journal um, to accompany the research process. And yes, that's true, but that's not the whole truth. And that's why I'm saying I'm trying to myth bust a little bit. Research journaling is to accompany the research process, but it's also to accompany your own professional development as a researcher, to see how you are um, tracking your, your achievements, to basically help you um, see that even if it's sometimes it just feels like a slog you are actually progressing quite a lot so research journals can be incredibly useful in that respect the other thing i'm um, sort of myth that's going around is that research journaling is academic writing and again it kind of is but it kind of isn't at the same time like amy said earlier in her talk Anything that you write down can be used later on. And in that respect, the research journal is the academic writing that you do. But at the same time, it doesn't have to always be the thing that you're going to use later on. It may be that you're making sense of something. It may be that you're creating something. Um, using Richard's example of creative writing, it may be that you're just trying to develop your own thoughts. And that is not necessarily something that you have to share. So as such, the research journal um, can be the kind of writing that's not necessarily academically polished or scholarly. It can be just your own thoughts about how something goes. At the same time, it doesn't actually have to be writing. Now, going back to the cover of my book, you will see that there are um, quite some messy things as well. There are scissors and paintbrushes. A, a, your research journal isn't limited to writing. Yes, it can be writing, but it can actually be also be some other form of expression. And then there is this myth about that there's the research entry in the research journal. So it's kind of a very beautiful, um, you know, um, entry with all the kind of literature um, 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 links and, and, and analyses. Yes, it can be that, but actually, again, it's not necessarily about that. You know, there is no rule that says it has to be a particular kind of thing. And in effect, it can be something like your CV. So in, in the book, I'm explaining how a full CV is something that's really useful to track your own development, to, to show how you've, you've progressed as a researcher. But it also, at the same time, is quite a time saver when you start applying for positions and roles, because you can pick and choose the things that are relevant. So having a full CV that you can draw from is really quite a useful way, not just about tracking your own movements, but also you know preparing the next, the future, your career. And then the final kind of big myth that's coming out is that there is the research journal. And again, I'd like to kind of bust that. Yes, I do have pretty ones, as you can see, but I also have um, less pretty ones, um, like just a very simple notebook or, or this one, which actually is written from back to front in two ways. And then I've got many, many pieces of paper that are in, you know, collected in, in, a, in a, 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 a portfolio like this. What I'm trying to say is that a good research journal doesn't have a particular look. Unfortunately, we don't tend to share each other's journals. We don't tend to show our journals much. So nobody really gets a feel for, for what it looks like once, once people you know, are doing that kind of work in their private space. But what I'm trying to say is that there are so many different ways of actually working creatively and, and scholarly and your research journal is, is the space that you can use for all of that. Now, in my own case, I think I've got about 50 odd journals, some of them finished, some of them never touched um, really, um, with just one or two entries. So again, it really is about trying to find what works for you. Nowadays, I've got one process that works really nicely, but it's not something that came out very easily or very quickly. So there is a lot of trial and error going on. And in that respect, you know, the research journal is there to accompany the process, but in the way that you want it to. And sometimes an audio recording or a blog post or um, a podcast may be your research entry. And that may be just as important and just as relevant later on when you're writing up as any other research entries that are written. Again, please do find my contact details here, and I look forward to hearing some of your questions and responding to those. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. We are doing well. This is really beginning to build up a picture of, of resources and ideas and support available for students. 
Um, so there's some lovely questions coming in the Q&A and we're trying to answer some of them in writing in case we don't have time um, to answer them all in verbally. So you, people might want to check that out even if you're not posting a question, have a look through the answers and see if there's useful information there. So let's have Narelle's video now and then we will go straight to the Q&A. Hello, my name is Narelle Lennon. I'm Associate Professor in Education, um, an interdisciplinary researcher in Education, Positive Psychology and the Arts, and I'm currently at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia, uh, where I'm also the Associate Dean Education in the School of Social Sciences, Media, Film and Education. I'm sorry I can't join you in person or live for the panel today. Uh, right now, it would be 3 a.m. for me, but I'm really delighted that I can join you from Beach Forest, a small town in the Otways, three hours from Melbourne. And as such, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, and I pay my respects, respects to the ancestors past, present and emerging. So whether you're an experienced researcher or you're just starting out, the place of creative methods is something you should really investigate. And I'm a huge advocate. I've worked with still image, moving image, visual narratives, photography, poetry, art making, drawing and collage as some of the ways to explore meaning making. And these ways can be data themselves or they can be ways to explore the data and present it. So working in this way is so rich. Uh, it's a way of sharing the voice of the participants, revealing the hidden in a context, asking hard questions and providing opportunities for participants to share in gentle ways or healing ways sometimes. And it's incredibly rewarding for yourself as well. It's naturally reflexive work and you embody the experience. So I've done this across a variety of contexts, community, social media, in schools, with educators, non-educators, in museums and galleries, with five-year-olds, and even with adults during the pandemic, for example. And what I love about creative research methods is that you can be really creative and innovative and anyone can do it. And you don't just have to come from an arts background, really, you can come from any background at all. So a theoretical framework is at the heart and we think of the intersection of existing knowledge and previously formed ideas about complex phenomena, intersecting with the research as epistemology, and then also looking through a lens and the methodological analytical, uh, analytical approach as well. So in this way, your methodological decisions really encompass both theory and methods in the ways that we think through the research problem um, and particularly what that means and how we do it. So in research, methodologies and theories are really used to describe the positioning of the research. So we are able to investigate in different ways and no matter what discipline you're coming from, you can be really innovative. And what we want to remember is that innovation is different to each discipline. So be careful not to compare yourself as well. So some starting out questions to consider would be what is possible? What is the purpose of your research? What question are you asking? Who do you want to work with? What's the best way to approach this research to glean meaningful data? How will the participants be involved? How do you position yourself and your research in its design and the context? How do you gather data and analyze uh, for your work and the processes? How might um, you work in regards to the data in creative ways? Or how might you present your data in different ways? And the most important question I think is what excites you? So pairing what is possible with what excites you are two really great questions. I think for any of us, whether you're experienced or you're just starting out, you're trying to figure what, out how you want to work with creative research methods are two questions that are really, really um, important for you. So creative research methods includes arts-based research, digitally mediated research, mobile methods, embodied research, mixed methods, and place-based, as well as transformative research frameworks. And what the great thing is that you can work with creative methods just independently, or you can partner them with more conventional or traditional methods as well. So 
Helen and I have worked with um, Dawn Manny and Megan McPherson, and we've explored lots of these questions that I've just posed in a, in a book. Um, and hopefully uh, Helen will be able to showcase that as part of the panel. Um, and so we've explored these, we've done a whole heap of different case studies and we've looked at the what, the how, the why, and we've un investigated in ways in terms of the tips and traps as well to unpack pack those for you. But before I say goodbye, I want to leave you with two practical approaches for you to explore what creative methods might be for you. And the first one is to either take our book or perhaps someone else's project or a research report from community and have a look at what they've written and have a look in terms of what fascinates you. So search around, find, find what fascinates you because that's a great starting point. And then read through, think about their approach. How can you replicate? it, work off it, bounce off it, and also think about, you know, going to their reference list as well and using that as a directory to keep on exploring. How have they developed their approach and sort of use their investigation to support you to the investigator as well. And my second tip is to open yourself up to other perspectives. So read, explore a variety of ways of working with creative methods uh, for, for different stages and think through the questions of what do you notice? How does it change your thinking? How do you consider the audience? How does it connect to your research question? How might asking particular questions in this way or presenting in this way support uh, the impact of your research? And I really invest in, you know, taking out that butcher's paper, the sticky notes and really mapping and, and reading and working off other people and ideas and brainstorming what is possible. And really with creative methods, you can take anything and apply it. So I hope you enjoy the panel. And if you want to reach out, i lovely to connect with you. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Rally Pops, which is R-E-L-L-Y-P-O-P-S. Or you can find me by my website, which is www.exploringcreateco.com. So wishing you all the best. Sorry I couldn't be there with you and hope to connect with you all um, in the future. See you later. Hello. That's great. Thanks, Narelle. I know you can't hear me, but thank you anyway. Um, and thank you also to somebody lovely in the chat who's just um, advocated for, for that book. Stephanie King, thank you. Um, really appreciate your vote. Uh, so we've been answering questions in writing because we only have 15 minutes left now. So if you haven't had a look at the q and I do recommend you go and have a look and look at the open questions and also the answered questions. In the open questions, there's an interesting resource on visual methods. In the answered questions, you can see some of the answers that we've written. But I'm also going to put some of these forward to the panelists um, to say a bit about panelists who haven't specifically answered in writing. So I'm going to start. There's a question about um, how some of the advice might be adjusted for people undertaking professional doctorates that have interim coursework leading up to the dissertation. Nicole, I know you work with people doing prof docs, probably no doubt others of you do too, but you haven't um, written an answer to this question. So I'm going to pick on you if that's OK to say, you know, when people are studying part time, etc., and doing assignments of five to seven thousand words, how would you adjust some of the advice we've heard? Um, Thank you. So I think there's there's two sort of elements with that picture in my question tied up. The one is the, the professional doctorate and the other one is the part time student. Um, so I think that, you know, in, in many ways, um, obviously, yes, if you're a professional doctorate and a part time student, you kind of, you know, Venn diagram and all. But what I'm trying to say is that some of this advice that has been given about um, ha having a research journal, about being methodical in your approach, about trying out creative approaches and methods, all of those things actually apply no matter whether you're a full-time student or a part-time student. So all of those things are still applicable. I would suggest that anyone who's a part-time student probably comes at this with um, a little bit more of a pragmatic idea that you're not going to be doing your, your, your writing on a daily basis because you haven't got the time because you are probably working and doing some other work or you've got family commitments, which is why you're doing the part-time doctorate. So there is something there about managing time. So I think the only thing that I would really sort of consider is how do you work with time? Um, and time stretches. So sometimes as a part time doctoral student, I found myself that actually when an interview fell through, it wasn't so much of a problem for me because, 
you know, one week was actually two weeks in, in full time scale. So in that respect, actually, you've got a lot a lot more sort of leeway um, for some kind of of those issues that are coming up that full time students don't necessarily have. So I think, you know, how to manage time is, is another one is, you know, I, for example, made use of every 10 minutes. If I was waiting in the car for, for my son to come out of school, I was reading something in those 10 minutes. I wasn't sitting there idling. I was using those 10 minutes. So I was very, I was very meticulous about using every minute I had. So I think that's the one thing about being a part-time student. The other thing about doing doctoral studies, you can actually, obviously you have to be careful about um, plagiarism. And I know that that's something that a lot of people are warning in, in, in doctoral studies because you're writing an assignment and then you're writing the thesis later on. But you can still self-cite. You just have to make sure that it's very clear that this is something that you have written in your assignment before and that you're referring to it. But if you do that, then you can build all of those assignments towards the thesis later on. Yes, you're not going to be able to cut and paste the whole um, five, five or 7,000 words, but you may be able to take a chunk out of it. And again, as long as you, it's very clear that this is something that you've said before and that you've submitted before, then it's okay. The problem comes that people kind of cut and paste and stick it in without referring to it. And then it looks like they're trying to self plagiarize. So that's the one thing that I would. And then obviously you have to work with your supervisors as to how much you have to rework certain things. But there is something there that actually, you know, it's not so different from from doing the PhD in terms of doing the EDD. I wouldn't suggest that there's much advice that needs to be adjusted or changed. Thank you, Nicole. That's great. Um, next one's for Richard because it's about field work. Richard has written a lovely book on field work um, and knows a lot about it. Um, advice on conducting field work online, specifically participant observation and interviews, um, but also, <coughs> excuse me, more generally, if you can, reasonably briefly. Thank you. And I might turn that question back to you, actually, Helen, in a moment, because I know that you've you've published uh, another book on on research during COVID times. Um, one I did publish a book on field work. It came out in 2012. That was on geography field work. And one part that was really missing from that was was a sense of what what one can do online. So a new edition is coming out um, next year, and that's going to bring in virtual field work and field work online. I'll be really really brief, but to say that some of the ways that people have done that, people conducting research in my department in Sheffield conducting research. In international development sometimes have worked with somebody on the ground who is able to conduct the field work if they're not able to travel to a place um, but also and i think I, I, in some ways that's cheating a little bit in covid times you, you could you could say that they certainly did that in ways that was, was ethical and sound but i think the other way to answer the question cheating and answering the other way to answer the question is that of course one can do interactive um, work online so I was talking about creative writing. I was involved in a creative writing workshop right through the, the height of COVID, which was online um, and um, involved three or four people. And, and we worked interactively. And so a lot of what I described that could have been done or was done in Glasgow uh, could also be done uh, virtually. And again, I'd really, really encourage you to, yes, there are things that we miss in terms of people's body language and some of the fun and the side chat, but yes, there's also all sorts of possibilities too. So um, I've been brief. I don't know if you want to add to that, Helen. It's actually a, a massive topic, isn't it? I mean, we could talk about it all day. Um, it enables all sorts of things like doing research with participants who are in other countries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but no, I think that's I think that's fine for now because we've got more questions coming in and I want to get to as many of them as I can. So thank you, Richard. I, there's one now. For, um, I'm going to ask Barbara this one. We've had a question about analysing media sources as a research method. Is that part of what you're covering in your desk based research book or can you speak about that at all? Um, not not especially um, not uh, as, as a research method. Is that the question, Helen? Yes, about analysing media sources as a research method. And the question is, will it be covered in this webinar? The answer might be no, but I thought I would just ask if anyone wants yes, to give a little bit yeah, on I that. mean, certainly, certainly in terms of using those visual res resources um, within, within the book, it covers, you know, things that um, using uh, social media, for instance, researching social media. Um, in a range of ways, but not as not specifically as a method. The method is more the, is the more general 
um, qualitative interpretivist method that is, um, that is the basis of the book. If that makes sense, I hope it does. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, I'm now looking, uh, now it seems only fair to ask a question to Amy. I'm just having a quick look for an Amy. But Amy's answered a lot of no, them in my I, I just waved my hand at you just to say um, that there is some content in my book around using those sorts of media approaches um, and also uh, my previous book on documentary analysis had a case study on how to use media and a second on how to use social media. Um, and so lots of different references for things in there. Yes, that's a helpful thing to say. That's great. Thank you. And um, I'm just having a look. There's another one here about um, creative research, the creative writing approach. This is another one for Richard. Can this be used for research about early years practitioners' perceptions of mindfulness? This is from Kylie Carr. A lot of these are anonymous, but this one's from Kylie. Uh, it's a great question, um, and, and I'm sure the answer is yes, and, uh, and the question is how, um, and that's something I think we'd need, we'd need to kind of think about, but I certainly think one, one point that's been raised, a number of people here have talked about research on sensitive and quite hard, hard to reach subjects, that certainly sounds like one of them, and I think a number of people have also talked about the suitability of creative methods, including creative writing, for, for coming at those uh, quite quite uh, elusive, but also really really important subjects. In the in the um, in our book on creative writing, we, we have a we have a chapter on on different forms of participatory creative writing, and they involve um, thinking about the different kinds of data that generates. One is the writing itself, and that's what I said a bit about in the talk. But another one is the diary um, of the of the um, facilitator and the and the, the workshop convener and their observations and um, coming back to Nicole perhaps again as well some some of their self-reflections on on what they're seeing and what they're learning um, which uh, which are part of a really rich field diary and there are opportunities to actually make those quite systematic with frameworks um, so rather than actually um, asking people to kind of do free writing there are opportunities to kind of use um, reflective models for example um, that lay out very cle clearly which step to take and what to reflect on and how to write so that the process itself becomes a little bit um, more structured and that in, for many people that's making it easier then. Yes, that's a really good point. And there are a few questions um, that are all addressing the topic of how do we justify using creative methods? How do we make it accept acceptable to use creative methods? So I'm going to say a little bit about this, because this is one I wrote the book on, um, which is Creative Research Methods, now in its second edition. And really, the way to do this, if you want to use creative methods and you're finding you're meeting resistance, then build the academic argument. Take the time to find the precedents that you can cite. And there are lots of precedents. There are posts on my blog um, detailing, um, showcasing different creative thesis and dissertation approaches, because of course it's a dissertation in the States, a thesis most other places. Um, so like there's one guy who wrote his thesis on a circus tent. Um, there's someone who did seven videos and seven chapters, and it's video, chapter, video, chapter. That was Anne Harris. Can't remember the name of the circus tent person. Um, there are people who've written, Kate Fox did her doctoral thesis um, in dialogue. Uh, so there are lots of ways to take creative approaches, and a lot of it has been done, and it really reassures supervisors if they know about stuff that's already happened and has been accepted and got through the dissertation. Nick Susanis did his dissertation, his doctoral dissertation, as a graphic novel. There are lots and lots of options. Nicole, were you wanting to come in there? Yeah, um, so I would like to say that Helen's book um, is my go-to, and, and what it does is it gives you examples from all sorts of disciplines, and it may be that what, whatever you want to do hasn't been done in your discipline. That may well be the case. I mean, not every discipline would be writing a graphic novel, so if that's something that's, 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 you, that's what you want to do in your discipline, then use that book to kind of, like Helen said, build the argument, and actually explain how the disciplinary um, boundary is not a boundary but but you know an opportunity um, and that's what what you what's really useful is kind of looking at the disciplinary um, conventions and if you, if it's not in your own discipline look elsewhere For more community and inspiration around this if you're on Twitter you can use the CR methods hashtag 
and once a week, uh, sorry, once a month, we have a CR Methods chat on a specific topic around creative methods, um, and people make connections there and, and build networks around this, um, because if anybody tells you you can't do it, actually you can, and it's all disciplines, as Nicole says. There's a great doctoral thesis written by Piper Harron, whose discipline was mathematics, pure maths, and she did a very creative, took a very creative approach to her doctoral writing, and she got a doctorate, so it certainly can be done right across disciplines. So we're coming into the last few minutes. Any final words? Yes, um, I would like to add to the um, CRM methods um, that Helen's just added. Um, also look up the Sage Methods space. Um, that is also a very, very good resource with many videos and, and, and blog posts about the weird and wonderful. Thank you. So um, from each of the other three of you, last, last important points very succinctly. Can I come first to Richard, please? My point is just that it's wonderful that you're all here. Uh, thank you for being here and, and just I've really appreciated the questions and, and your ideas. I, I encourage you to, uh, to be creative and I encourage you to, uh, to do stuff that we haven't done yet. Take this forward. Absolutely that. Thank you. Barbara. Um, just to say thank you again, but also to say to encourage you to think beyond what you normally would think of in relation to qualitative research. Think beyond the interview and the focus group and look at what's out there and what's readily available for you to access. Thank you. And Amy, your takeaway punchline? I would say to try and have fun when you're doing your dissertation. It shouldn't be painful. There should be a minimum level of enjoyment and just good luck. Just get stuck in, get it done. And even if you don't enjoy it, it's only a few months of your life. <laughs> Lovely. So it just remains for me to thank all of our panellists, Narelle in Australia, uh, Richard, Nicole, Barbara and Amy, and to wish you all the very best of luck with all your research projects. Thank you for being with us and um, go and do wonderful things.